so yeah, everyone, uh, hi, I'm Carlo, I'm Android developer, but today I won't talk about Android, I'll talk about uh, IoT on the mobile. So let's start. Uh, first, uh, let's quick re quickly remind ourselves what is IoT or what is an IoT device. IoT device, it can be a smart air fryer, a smart light bulb, a smart watch, a smart uh, speaker, smart thermostat, and so on. And what all of those devices have in common, besides the word smart in their name, is they have sensors, they run software, and they are connected to a network. Usually that network is internet, but th that doesn't have to be the case every single time. Okay, and uh, why do we have IoT products? First, uh, from consumer perspective, we, uh, consumer want, consumers want IoT products because they offer uh, value for them. Uh, so, some values that consumers can get are uh, convenience, health monitoring, potential savings, and personalization. We can think of a simple example of uh, setting the heating in your apartment while you're at work with your phone. So, this is very con convenient for you. It can maybe lead to uh, potential savings and so on. Also, if you have a smartwatch, you are probably monitoring your health. You can customize it, personalize it, and so on. Uh, and why do clients uh, create IoT products besides the fact that uh, customers want to buy them? Well, IoT products for customers, they, uh, they can improve uh, customer experience. Uh, for clients, they can improve customer experience. They can enable data-driven decision-making. They can lead to product innovation. And all of that, in the end, can lead to competitive advantage. So all of this pretty much sums up we as a business think we can make more money. And that's why the clients like Philips, Signify, or maybe someone else will approach Infinum to collaborate uh, on mobile apps for IoT products. Uh, to enable the use case that we discussed earlier of controlling your uh, smart thermostat with your phone, you need to connect your device, in this case smart thermostat, to your phone or to the mobile app. So let's talk about that a bit. So we saw there are many, many different IoT devices. There are many different use cases for them. And of course, there are many different ways they can be connected to the mobile app. So it's kind of hard to define some generalist flow, but we'll try to do it anyway. Uh, so first, when you want to connect your IoT device with your uh, uh, phone, you need to discover that app. What does discovery mean? Uh, it means searching for the device. For example, you would start a Bluetooth search on your phone and try to find that device. Uh, after you find the device, uh, you need to establish the connection with it. Uh, again, in Bluetooth example, that would mean pairing with the device. <coughs> after you establish connection with the device, uh, you need to connect the device to the network, again, to, usually to the internet. Why? Because Without internet, the internet of things is just things, right? Uh, and finally, after all of this is done, you need to do some sync. Uh, this is a bit abstract term, but usually this, uh, in this, steps, uh, this step, the data is, is exchanged between everyone who is involved of process of onboarding. And uh, who is usually involved? So besides, the, um, of course, the device and the app, there is a cloud component which can store uh, some data, for example, on the backend and so on. And during the process, the app uh, component uh, serves as a glue between everyone who is involved. OK, uh, enough of abstract talking. Let's take a look at some real example. Uh, so usually, you can hear that programmers turn uh, coffee into code, but today, I'll show you how you can turn code into coffee with our coffee app. And of course, to do that, you'll need to connect your coffee machine with your coffee app. Uh, so our coffee machine will use uh, Wi-Fi to communicate with uh, app. Again, no Bluetooth, only Wi-Fi. And um, inside our coffee app, we have a library, a module that we call SDK, which abstracts all uh, communication between the app and the device. And if this is done correctly, it can, it can even uh, be reused in multiple apps. So it's a great way to do it. Uh, so in the coffee, if the user doesn't uh, have uh, the device connected to the app, 
he has a screen uh, that doesn't have many options and the idea is to lead the user to the onboarding so he can connect his device with the app. If he clicks on orange, big orange button that was on previous screen, the onboarding process will start and the first uh, step in that onboarding process is uh, device discovery. First, uh, we'll uh, show user uh, device picker, device selector, where user has to uh, confirm which exact device uh, he has. Why is a good idea to have a mechanism like this? Uh, so you can get more info about device, uh, for example, like model ID. When you're searching for device, you can guide, with that information, you can guide the search. Uh, for example, if you start a Bluetooth search, you might discover headphones, you might discover wireless mouse, a smartwatch, and so on. But if you have some additional info like model ID, you can use that to filter out the devices and only show the devices that user uh, needs to see that you want to connect to. Uh, after the user picks the, uh, the device he wants to connect to, uh, we in the Coffee app search for the device. So at that moment, our app is connected to the internet, to the network that we call, in, that is called Infinum, but it can of course be called uh, as you want. And uh, our coffee machine is in pairing mode, which means it is broadcasting uh, the Wi-Fi. Uh, the name of that Wi-Fi or the SSID is Philips Setup. And our app is looking for that exact, exact Wi-Fi. If that Wi-Fi is found, it is considered that we have found our coffee machine. Uh, after we found our coffee machine, we need to establish the connection between the app and the device. Uh, so in this moment, the coffee app will disconnect from uh, this home network that has internet access and will simply connect to the Philips setup Wi-Fi. But that is not all. We have one more step. Uh, we call this step proof of possession. So I might call it pairing. And what happens here is app sends request to the machine that it wants to connect. The user uh, needs to physically confirm that connection on the device. And if that is done, the device will send positive response to the app. And only in that moment, we will consider that the connection has been established between the app and the device. Uh, why do we have this step? And why is a good idea to have a mechanism like that in uh, your flow? Uh, because you want to know with which exact machine you connected. For example, if you have four same machines in the office, you want to be sure with which exact machine you connected. And also, if you want to connect to your neighbor's machine, but your neighbor doesn't want that, this uh, mechanism can prevent that. Uh, after we establish the connection between the app and the device, we need to connect our device to the internet, of course. Uh, what, we, uh, what we are doing here is first, we need to uh, discover all the Wi-Fi networks that are available. So our phone, our app will look for Wi-Fi networks, but you have to take into account here that maybe the machine doesn't see all Wi-Fi networks. For example, your phone uh, can connect to 2.4 and 5 gigahertz networks, but the machine can only see 2.4 gigahertz networks. So you have to take that into account. Uh, you display the, all the networks that are available uh, to the user in the UI, and then user selects the network uh, he wants to connect to. And then, of course, he needs to enter the credentials. When credentials, credentials are entered, uh, they are sent to the machine. Machine sends them to the, uh, the Wi-Fi or to the router. And if uh, everything is successful, the machine gets connected to, the, to that Wi-Fi network. Uh, the credentials are stored in the machine. And uh, your phone, your app gets disconnected from, directly from machine and reconnected back to the, net, to the same network, in this case, Infinum network. Uh, and uh, after, the, uh, after the machine has been connected to the internet, we need to do final step, which is sync. In this step, the cloud component comes into part. And um, there, are, there are quite a few things that can happen here. So you can create the machine model on uh, app, app's backend. Uh, the exact machine can be linked to your account. Maybe the creden uh, credentials for secure communication with cloud can be downloaded and stored on machine, and so on. If everything uh, goes through without the problem, 
uh, we'll get the success screen, which means we are connected with the machine. Okay, uh, but like what now when we are connected? This is not the end of our journey. Uh, it means uh, we can uh, communicate and control the machine, which enables us quite a few cool features and uh, cool use cases. Uh, one of those uh, features is the feature that we call remote brewing. Uh, the remote brewing uh, enables user to com configure the, the coffee on his machine and click on the brew button and then the app will send the request to the machine and the machine will brew coffee. The, that can happen two ways. First way uh, is locally, in local network. We call this type of communication local communication or local control. So when the request uh, leaves uh, the, the phone, it goes to the router and uh, router doesn't send the request to the internet. Rather, it uses local network to, to route the request directly to the machine. On the other hand, uh, we can have cloud communication. And here, what happens is uh, once uh, the request reaches the router, it goes through the internet, through the cloud component, and then the cloud component is responsible to, delivering, uh, to deliver that request to the machine. And here, uh, when we are talking about requests, we are not talking about the usual HTTP requests. Rather, you would want to use some more specialized protocol. Uh, example of this is MQTT. Uh, why would you use that? Uh, because it, it can offer better performance uh, because it works on idea of uh, publisher and subscriber. Um, and okay, maybe you, uh, you, you will ask yourself why, why do we want to have like two ways to control machine, to communicate with machine? Why just not uh, enable cloud, uh, cloud communication, for example? Well, uh, if you're using cloud, that means that your expenses will uh, scale with the number of requests, which maybe the client or the business doesn't want. And maybe in some cases, like remote brewing, client will say, we, uh, if you uh, remotely brew coffee while you're at work and somebody is around the machine at home, that someone might get injured and might sue us. So we want to avoid that, of course. Please don't sue us, uh, disable cloud control, only use local control. Okay, on, and on the coffee, uh, besides the cool feature of remote brewing, uh, the communication with machine also enables some other things. Uh, so you can see the statuses of your filters. Uh, for example, uh, if your wa water filter is in bad condition and so on, you can even get uh, notified uh, if the filters need uh, replacing uh, and if you need to, bu uh, to buy a new one. You can also set the scheduler in your app, uh, meaning uh, the machine will automatically turn at some time. Uh, for example, maybe bef before you leave for work each day, you want your machine to turn off and so on. And of course, we have the usual suspect of remotely powering on and powering off the machine and many more, which uh, I'll not go into. Okay, uh, I, I also want to talk about bit about challenges when you're implementing the flow of connecting uh, the device, uh, the, the IoT device and the app. Uh, so, from uh, Android developers' perspective, uh, different OSs can be different OS versions can be challenging. For example, in Android, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, the way you handle Wi-Fi communication can uh, depend on which version of OS you, you are using, you, or the user is using. So you have to cover uh, all of those examples and that can be tricky at times. Also, uh, you need to account for all, uh, all un unhappy flows. Uh, so as we saw, the process of connecting the machine and the, the app is not a single step process. It has many steps. There are many things that can go wrong. So you, ha you have to think uh, about, can we retry some action? In which state is our app? In which state is the machine? Can we navigate back and so on? And this can only be, this is only not like exhausting for the developer to implement, but also for QA to validate because some flows might take, uh, might need uh, the machine in specific state and so on. Another challenge is also supporting customers uh, with the issues. So 
uh, as we all know, uh, not all customers are like tech savvy. Some of them are like even impatient and might just click next, 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 next on your flow. So you have to think about those cases as well. You have to think about how to make your uh, flow as simple and as intuitive as possible. And if some error happens, you have to think about how to make sure that user understand what is wrong. And if he doesn't understand what is wrong, how can he reach to customer support or, so, or something like that without an, any friction? And one more challenge that I want to talk uh, to about is um, device or cloud problems. So as we saw, both uh, the device and cloud uh, are uh, playing part into onboarding. And those parts have their own development team. Usually, they're being developed uh, in parallel with uh, the mobile app. And sometimes uh, during the development, it can be very hard to figure out uh, where exactly the problem is coming. Is it coming from like your site? Is it coming from cloud site? Or is it coming from like device site? And so on. And also the communication between the different teams, uh, especially if they're not like in the same location, same company, can also get a bit messy at times, and that can cause you headaches. Uh, but at least you can blame some uh, like bugs uh, on them. And yeah, that's uh, everything from me. Uh, thanks for listening. Do we have any questions? What are some of the biggest differences you notice between the platforms, like the Android and iOS? Well, usually these the the lower level differences, uh, the way you communicate with, let's say, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, can be uh, the biggest differences. Any more questions? <laughs>